we began last week to look at some of the practical implications of this passage. And we saw that this passage again is a further development of Paul's wonderful teaching about what the Christian gospel is. And I was saying to you last week how we all need a very clear and ever deepening understanding of the gospel. The gospel must never be allowed to be boiled down and preserved just in its minimalistic sense of say John 3.16. The gospel is vast, it is colossal, it is massive and profound. And as Christian people as we grow up in our faith towards maturity we must be growing in our understanding and in our love for and in our awe towards the gospel of Christ. So we need a clear and deep understanding of the gospel. Now what we have seen exegetically here from Romans 12, uh, 5, 12 to the end is that what Paul is telling us here is that the terrible problem of sin and death is something that has flooded into our world through the disobedience of one man. And that one man was Adam. As a result of Adam's sin, we now inherit Adam's sinful nature. So we come into this world, each one of us, with a sinful nature, with, a, with an inclination in the heart to serve self and to live in a way that breaks God's law. And what Paul is telling us here is that we are all, all human beings are ultimately powerless to control or resolve the problem of the power of sin over us. We try. We try by looking in religion and morality. We try by looking maybe at uh, various philosophies to overcome the problem of sin. We may try looking even at politics and things like that and social reform. But the reality is we can't deal with it. And we also see in this passage that Paul t has told us that the, the law that God has given, the law of God as given through Moses, we actually look carefully at it shows us how bad and how serious the situation is. And it is profoundly serious. The problem that we as human beings have inherited Adam's sinful nature and that there is nothing we ourselves as human beings can do about this. But Paul then goes on because of course he's dealing with the gospel here to show us that the good news of the gospel is that grace, justification and righteousness have also come into the world through the gift and obedience of one man. And that one man is, of course, Jesus Christ. And the power of the grace which has been revealed in Jesus Christ is far more powerful, ultimately, than the power of sin and death. And so what Paul has been dealing with here in chapter 5, verses 12 to 21, this amazing section of the New Testament, wonderful part of this letter, is that he is using the two men, Adam and Jesus, to point to the reality of who we are as human beings in sin and who we may be as a result of grace in Jesus Christ. And so having grasped this, we looked last week at one great area of And I put it to you under the title of The Joy We Are to Have in the Church as the New Humanity in Christ. You see, coming out of Adam is humanity as we generally know it, humanity in the raw, what we would call human nature. Men and women, boys and girls, babies coming into the world with a nature that loves darkness rather than light. But the hope is that by faith in Jesus Christ, now emerging from Christ comes a new humanity. A humanity that is not under God's condemnation, but instead a humanity that is justified. As I mentioned in prayer earlier this morning, a humanity that can go to God in prayer, knowing that we've broken his laws, knowing that we're sinful, and yet go with boldness and great 
confidence. Why? It's all because of the work of the one man, Jesus Christ, and what he has done for us. So there is a new humanity in Christ. And the church, which is the gathering of believers, it's not a building, is it? It's Christians together. There is to, is to reflect the reality of this now new life amongst the new humanity. So the church is ever to be counter-cultural. It is to be a positive counter-cultural challenge of grace to our sin-corrupted society around us. Now this morning I want us to take us to, I hope, time willing, uh, permitting rather, uh, to three further clearly area, linked areas of application. The first is that we also see applied from these words here in Romans 5, 12 to 21, that everyone in the world needs the gospel. Secondly, the world needs the law of God for the gospel to be good news. And thirdly, the world needs the grace of God for the gospel to be good news. I would say I hope we'll get to all three of those, we'll see. But the first certainly we will. And that is that everyone in the world needs the gospel. Romans 5 is one of the biblical passages that establishes this so very clearly. It addresses one of the fundamental philosophical questions of life. A question that human beings have been grappling with since the beginning of time and will continue to until Christ returns. Why is the world as it is? And more pertinently, why am I the way I am? It's a simple question, but it is a profound question. And it faces us as human beings. What is it about us as human beings that enables us to sometimes produce such great beauty, and yet at the same time, such great evil and destruction? This came back to me some years ago when uh, it was recently that a photograph album had been found uh, in the uh, possession of someone following the Second World War and it was made up of photographs of uh, guards in a particular concentration camp where very evil things were happening, horrendous things. But it showed these guards at leisure. It showed them going out for a walk with their family. There were photographs of them uh, sitting around enjoying a meal and all this sort of thing. And then crucially there were photographs of them going to the theatre together and sitting and listening to beautiful classical music being played and obviously enjoying the moment. But of course the horrific reality was of those photographs was that those same photographs that showed scenes of wonderful appreciation of nature, of art and culture and, and food and drink and happy family times together were precisely the same individuals who were wreaking such dreadful evil on the lives of thousands and thousands of men and women, boys and girls. And there's the paradox of humanity in its most dramatic form. We are capable of found beauty and sometimes acts of great sacrifice and great love but we are also capable of profound evil and destruction so why is the world as it is why am I the way I am why is my mouth capable of saying great things constructive things, kind things, and loving things, and yet at the same time also capable of saying profoundly wicked, spiteful, destructive, and hurtful things. And why is your mouth like that? And why is your mind like that? This is a profoundly important question, isn't it? The scientific brains can be used to develop things that both save lives and take lives. Why is the world like this? Well, in many ways, Romans 5 addresses the cause. And prior to Romans 5, Jesus himself summed this up with, I think, words which are so helpful and so vital. On chapter 3, verse 19, this is the verdict. 
words of Christ. He's speaking about humanity. This is the great analysis, if you like, of the Son of God on us as human beings. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness instead of light. Because their deeds were evil. There's something intrinsic about us. That even in the very face of the light of the world. Christ himself. Men and women could turn away. Could despise him. Ultimately desire his death and murder him. Why is that? Well it's the same reason why we're capable as human beings of great beauty. And great evil and great destruction. There is something fundamental in us as human beings which is corrupt, has been corrupted, and is wrong. Men love darkness instead of light. Those are the words of Christ. Where does that love come from? Is it that we love darkness over light sometimes? Why is it that you can't lock, well, you've had to lock your car door this morning? Why is it that you've had to lock your front door as you came to church? Why do we live in a culture that needs a police force and a legal system? Why is it that that is not just particular to Llanelli and Wales, but that's the case right through the whole world? Why do we live in a world where there are wars and conflicts? Well, Romans 5 shows us, and has shown us, that the root cause of all of this is Adam's sin. Verse 12, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all men. That phrase, all men, is speaking of the entirety of humanity. The power of sin reigns in every human being. The power of death reigns in every human being. The world is as it is because it is a fallen world. We fell with Adam in Eden. Now understanding this is just as important for the Christian as well as for the person who is not. Though I would say to you this morning, if you're not a Christian yet... This is really important for you. But for a moment, let me address Christians here. You see, as a Christian, understanding this is vital for life, isn't it? It helps you, it gives you a clear theological foundation for your own understanding of the world. Christians are not to be naive, you see, about life and about culture and about society. As a Christian, you're to know what the world is capable of. And why it is capable of it. And why people are the way they are. As a Christian, you should understand human nature better than anyone. And so you know that all the very best efforts of human beings, our politicians, our civic leaders, our scientists, our entertainers, all the great efforts to end world poverty or end injustice or somehow put right all the evils in the world. All of these great attempts, as, as commendable as many of them are, ultimately are all doomed to fail. And generations will come and go. But humanity remains essentially the same. We have the same problems in the 21st century, don't we, that people had in the 1st century. Read your ancient history. You'll see it there. They too had power struggles. Internal battles, corrupt politicians. They too knew what it was to know on a daily basis in their own relationships. Relationship failure. They experienced the sharp end and the consequences of greed, war, inequality and injustice. These things are just as active in our world today as they have ever been. Why? Well the answer again is here in Romans 5, the heart of human beings has not changed. The problem of what we inherited with in Adam is as much a problem in the 21st century as it was in the very first century. And the great analysis of Christianity in the final, uh, in the final analysis of Christianity on the whole issue of what is a human being is that no matter how advanced we may be in terms of technology, in terms of science, learning and understanding, we are still essentially grappling with the same problems that human beings have always grappled with. Whether it's a flint tool in your hand or an iPad, it makes no difference. We're all as human beings in the same predicament, under the power of sin and death. You know, on one occasion, a woman came and broke a very 
expensive jars of perfume over Jesus' feet. Eating at the home of uh, Simon the leper, a man probably Jesus had healed. And the Bible records this as one of the most lavish expressions of love and appreciation for what Christ, for who Christ was and for what Christ had done in this woman's life. It, in fact, as you read the Gospel accounts, it's probably the most lavish expression of appreciation of someone recognizing who Christ is and what he has done. Now, in the room are the disciples, and they see this happen. And Matthew records that their response was not to rejoice in this, but to say, it's waste. This perfume could have been sold at a high price, and the money given to the poor. And Jesus responds with these words, the poor you will always have with you, but you will not always have me. And in those words, the poor you will always have with, me, with you, he is kind of laying down what is part of the Christian worldview. He acknowledges here that there will always be economic and social injustice. It always will be a feature of life. That's how humanity is. Why is this? Well, Paul is telling us here, it's because sin has entered the world. And it has come not to just particularly evil individuals, but it has affected every single human being. Jesus' response is powerful, isn't it? He's not saying that we shouldn't care about the poor. In fact, he was quoting Deuteronomy 15 verse 11. There will always be poor people in the land. Therefore, I command you to be open-handed towards your brothers and towards the poor and the needy in your land. But the point he's making is this. There will always be social evils and injustice. Why? Because the problem is rooted in the heart of the human being. So this brings us back to the issue, why is the world like this? And it is only you as a Christian who really understands this through the gospel in a way that is comprehensive. Sin entered the world through one man and death through sin. And in this way death came to all men because all sinned. That's the reason. That's why the world is as it is. Why is there awful problems of upheaval and injustice in the Ukraine today? Why are there terrible problems of persecution and exploitation in places like North Korea? Why are people blowing themselves up in the name of false religion and destroying hundreds of people in Baghdad in the last week, even if the BBC hasn't deemed it worthy enough to report it? 200 people killed in one day last week in Baghdad. Why is the world as it is? Why is there evil in your workplace? injustice why do people lie to you and exploit you why do you hear the neighbors arguing why do you read things in your newspaper why is the world as it is the answer is sin has entered the world through one man and the effect of that sin is found in every single human heart now you might be sat here tonight, and you, this morning rather, and you might be, uh, I think I've been preaching quite that long, yet, but, uh, but uh, you might be sat here this morning, you might say to yourself, this is a terribly dreadful view of the world, isn't it? This is a dreadful view of humanity. This is hor horrifically pessimistic. And indeed, one of the criticisms of the Christian worldview is that it is pessimistic. Well, I would say to you this morning, it is, in terms of having confidence in humanity. The Christian worldview is very pessimistic in terms of what we as human beings can do to sort out the real problems of our world. But of course the Christian worldview is ultimately not focused on us as human beings, is it? The gospel is ultimately not about you and me and our sin. The gospel is about Jesus Christ. Then immediately the Christian worldview becomes gloriously and wonderfully full of hope. Jesus is the light of the world. He's come into our world to deal with this issue. He's come into this world to deal with the issue of the human heart. That's why he's described in these dramatic terms as light for darkness, hope for the despairing. You know, one of the great Old Testament statements 
in Isaiah, getting us ready, getting the world ready for the entrance of Christ into the world, is found in Isaiah 61. It's a wonderful statement. Listen to this. It's speaking about what Christ will bring to our world. Locked into sin, what will Christ bring? The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me. It's messianic words speaking about Christ coming. Because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the broken hearted. To proclaim freedom for the captives. And release from darkness for the prisoners. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. And the day of vengeance of our God. To comfort all who mourn. Now people come to Isaiah 61, 1 and 2. And they think that uh, God is just simply speaking there. In terms of social issues like world poverty. Uh, those who are in prison because of injustice and that sort of thing and, and those who have received evil things at the hands of men. Well, the Lord is certainly sees these things and he is concerned about them. But this is a statement about the gospel. Bind up the broken hearted. He's speaking about us as human beings whose hearts have been broken as a result of sin. The poverty that we find ourselves in because of the power of sin. Christ now is coming to announce good news. To bind up the broken hearted. To proclaim freedom for captives. Release from darkness. And to bring vengeance on sin. And this is the gospel, isn't it? This is the good news. Christ's coming is the year of the Lord's favour. And the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn. There he is, born in Bethlehem. And the angels announce to the shepherds with great joy, The Saviour has been born. This is the day of God's vengeance. It is vengeance on sin. It is vengeance on what Adam has produced and left into the world and is found in your heart and mind. In Jesus Christ is great hope. That's why Paul in verse 15 says, the gift is not like the trespass. No, no, what you find in Jesus Christ is completely different. And then he goes on to point at the amazing parameters of the gospel for if the many that's speaking really of the totality of the human race died by the trespass of the one man how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man Jesus Christ overflow to the many there is now in Jesus Christ something more wonderful more glorious more powerful than the power of sin and death there is a power in the world today. There is a power in our world which is far greater than any of the evil manifest through Adam and sin which has come to you and to me. But what does the world do with this good news? The unbelieving world. Well, of course, it rejects it. Those words from Isaiah 61, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me, the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor, bind up the broken hearted, freedom for captives and so on. Those words, that portion from Isaiah were read by Jesus once when he sat down and spoke in the synagogue in Nazareth. And the Bible records that when he had finished speaking, he rolled up the scroll with those words of Isaiah, announcing the good news of what the Messiah would do with the issue of sin. And he said this to the people who were there. Today, this scripture, perhaps he was holding it in his hand at the time, is fulfilled in your hearing. You might say, it's wonderful, isn't it? Good news for the poor. Freedom for prisoners. Day of God's vengeance on sin. How amazing. You'd think that suddenly the, the synagogue in Nazareth would have erupted in praise and hallelujahs and worship to God. Luke 4 records, all the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of the town and took him to the brow of a hill on which the town was built in order to throw him down the cliff. Now, friends, that's what the world does with the gospel. It is a graphic snapshot of the world's rejection of the gospel. Something Paul himself would write about when he writes the church at Corinth. He says the message of the cross 
The great focus, the pinnacle of the news of God's love for humanity. The sacrifice of his only begotten son for our sins that we might be made new. The message of the cross, writes Paul, is foolishness to those who are perishing. And later on he says, the man without the spirit does not accept the things that come from the spirit of God. They're foolishness to him. He cannot understand them. Because they're spiritually discerned. You see, that's the problem with the power of sin and death in humanity. It doesn't just create injustice and intolerance. It doesn't just create awful, dreadful things like wars and killing. It doesn't just create lying and deceit. It blinds us spiritually to the reality of the love of God in Jesus Christ. So people can literally be confronted with the Son of God. Proclaiming for the first time the fulfillment of those wonderful words. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And has anointed me. Anointed me to preach good news to the poor. And the very next thing they seek to do is to murder him. This is the power of sin and death. It is more powerful than you and I can ever imagine. And every single human being is in its grasp. The only solution is the power of the gospel of God. And there's an irony there, isn't it? The very thing we reject by nature, the very thing we call foolishness, is the only thing that can deliver us from the power of sin and death. The only thing. Christ came to break the power of sin and death. To proclaim freedom for captives. Release from the darkness for the prisoners. And on Calvary. He accomplished it. He dies. In the place of sinners. He dies for what Adam brought into our world. Every single conceivable, twisted, destructive, perverted expression of sin. No matter how horrific and blasphemous in its manifestation, no matter how mocking and intense in its nature, no matter how destructive in its power on the cross, Christ dies for sinners. By being punished with the punishment that those sins deserve. Of all the things Jesus said on the cross, and there are many wonderful things, aren't there? The greatest thing are those last two words. Three words in sorry, three words in English, one word in Greek. It is finished. The key question is this that you've got to face up to. What was it that Jesus was finishing on the cross? And the answer is this. He was breaking the power of sin and death. He was drinking down the punishment that should be ours. And he was bringing salvation into the world. This is why the early apostles, when told to shut up about the gospel, and when people say, well, we understand something very exciting has happened in your life, and that's fine for you, but we don't want you telling anybody else about it. So they commanded them, the religious authorities in Jerusalem, commanded them to shut up and not tell anybody anymore about this Jesus from Nazareth. Do you remember their response? We cannot but speak of these things. Why? They realized the majesty of what Christ had done. And they realized the horrific situation that humanity is in. Without, without this. Again they also spoke these words. Salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven. Given to men. By which we must be saved. And that's the reality for you this morning. If you're not a Christian. You're either in Adam. Or in Christ. It's either the power of sin and death that reigns in you. Or it is either the power of justification means in you. Friends, the whole world needs the gospel. You don't need me to press that point home. 
You can see it. We've got friends here from Korea. They're here training in Clanatli. Why? Because they know the whole world needs the gospel. But everyone in your street needs the gospel. Everyone in your school needs the gospel. Everyone in this town needs the gospel. Everyone in Wales needs the gospel. Everyone in the world needs the gospel. This is not religious obligation. This is not, this is somehow our duty. We must speak to others of Christ. No, this is the reality. Everyone really does need the gospel. Why? For salvation is found in no one else. There is. No other name. Search the history books. Bring forth the examples of great humanity. Is salvation found in Gandhi? Is salvation found in the Buddha? Is salvation found in Mohammed? Ultimately, no. Why? For there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. No other saviour. It's only the cross of Jesus Christ that deals with the dreadful problem of the human heart. So what is the church to do with the gospel? It's to take it out. What are you to do with it? You're to take it out. You're to pray for this regularly. Every day, pray that new people will hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and be born again of the Spirit of God. Everyone need, in the world needs the gospel of God. Now we're not going to get through all three of these this morning. But we very quickly move to the second thing, which is the world needs the law of God for the gospel to be good news. Because you might start saying to yourself, well, how does the church do this? How does a Christian take this news to a world which regards this world as foolishness? And he says, all right, for you to say this, but my family are totally indifferent to Christ. They're absolutely impervious. Or I speak to my friends at work and they say, well, I'm really pleased for you. It's great you've got a faith and you go to church on a Sunday. That's wonderful. I don't, but I'm pleased for you. He said, oh, but then they just don't seem concerned. And you say, well, this is really serious. And I, uh, How in the world can the, can the world around us begin to discover that they need the gospel and that the gospel is good news? And the answer is the law of God. Verse 20. The law was added, that is, it was given... So that the trespass might increase. Now, be careful. This does not mean that the law was given by God to lead people into sin or to make them sin more. Instead, it means that the law was given to show up the reality of our sin. Remember the Sermon on the Mount? You have heard it was said, do not commit adultery. But, says Jesus, I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. The law shows us, the law of God ultimately shows us the parameters of what is and isn't acceptable to God. And this is so important for our culture today, where we live in a culture which is called, it says, we have a postmodern mindset, which basically means it's a philosophy at work in our culture, where everybody says that it's all right to do whatever you want to do, so long as you don't harm anyone. That's the issue that seems to be the final parameter for what's right and wrong in our culture, is whether you harm someone. So whatever your understanding of life is, whatever your thing is, it's fine. As long as you don't hurt anyone else. But along comes the law of God. And the law of God challenges that, doesn't it? You know, it's interesting. The further our culture moves away from its Christian heritage and the inevitable moral influence of that on law and culture the greater the chasm becomes between what is accepted as normal in our culture and the law of God. There have been massive social moves since the 1960s in sexual politics. Probably the biggest one at the moment, as you well know, is the, a change in our culture on the whole area of homosexuality. We've seen changes in law. We've seen certainly a change in its presence in mainstream entertainment. In the past, back in the 1970s, a homosexual character was usually in entertainment as a figure of fun. Today they're often presented as something quite heroic. There's a whole area of gay marriage. 
and practicing clergy in certain denominations openly about their openly practicing homosexual lifestyle. We live in a culture now that accepts this. And the move towards accepting, particularly the issue of practicing homosexual clergy, is ever touted by those denominations of the need of the church to keep in step with society. All of this appears to be the voice of reason. Why shouldn't two people who love each other have the same rights under law, regardless of their gender? People should be free to be who they are. And of course we're sympathetic to that. We hear phrases like fairness, equality and inclusiveness. And as Christians we want to be fair. We love equality and we want to be inclusive. And it all seems fine, doesn't it, to the person who's not a Christian. As long as it doesn't harm anyone. But the point Paul has been making here in Romans 5 is that that is precisely the way we think as human beings. Until one day it comes into our lives, the law of God. And we discover what we'd consider to be fair and okay, and the standards that we use, are actually very different from the standards God uses. And this is extended to the whole area of our lives, our own lives. You look at your own life, you're not a Christian this morning maybe, you say, well actually I think I'm quite a good person. I don't do many of the wicked and evil things that other people do. I like to think I'm kind and good and all of it. And you use a standard, which is the standard of our culture. Then along comes the law of God. And it says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your will. And you say, well, that's impossible. No one can do that. The law of God was given that it might show up and reveal precisely in our lives where sin is. And of course the reality is we don't see it. So many of the things we think are okay and all right and are about fairness and tolerance and inclusiveness and seem to us, when God looks at it, he sees it very differently. (coughs) The world will never see the gospel to be good news apart from the law of God. And this is Paul's point about the law. It does a job. It fulfills a function. When the law was given, we begin to understand specifically what sin is. It's why he introduces the word trespass. I gave you a little illustration last week, didn't I? I said, you're on holiday with the kids, you're in a lovely big manor house and there's a lovely big grass, you've been cooped up in the car for ages, the kids are going crazy and so you get a ball out, you boot it into the middle of the field, you say, go chase that. And they have a great time, there's loads of laughing and cheering and suddenly a fellow in a uniform comes running out, waving his hands in the air and he's very, very angry and you think, what's this about? And he says, didn't you see the sign? Didn't you see the sign? And suddenly you look and there's a sign that says, keep off the grass. Well, you didn't see it. You thought it was okay. But it wasn't okay. That's how the law of God works. As humanity, we're happily running, dancing on the grass, thinking everything's fine. The law of God is there to show us it isn't fine. It isn't okay. And you have a huge, big problem. You see, foundational to the church's work of getting the gospel out to everyone in the world is that the church must first announce the bad news of sin. And how does the church do this? By engaging the world with what God has to say in his law. Sadly, there are many churches that fail to do this. They may preach passionately and at length on the love of God, but ignore completely the law of God and the reality of sin. They rarely mention sin. They soft-pedal any reference to sin. Inevitably, such churches are popular and well-liked. But here's the reality. Here's the hard reality. Without the law, the gospel of Jesus Christ is just another message. With the law, the gospel is good news. Without the preaching of the law, the gospel is reduced to being a message in a vacuum, pointless and easily dismissed. Why should I trust Christ? Well, actually, I, I find the teachings of the Buddha more compelling. 
Well, there's a point. Someone else says, yeah, well, let's look at them. Or Gandhi. Gandhi, Jesus, Jesus, Gandhi. Well, you're yeah, two very interesting fellows. Did an awful lot of good. Well, I, I, Gandhi, I, I think, I, I'm going to go for Gandhi. When you understand the law of God, and it's news that you're in the grip of sin, you see Gandhi as you see yourself, a sinner. Only Jesus Christ in that moment. He becomes not just an option, he becomes a vital necessity, doesn't he? So the preaching of the law, or the announcing of the law, or getting the law of God over to people, is essential in the whole area of evangelism. The law's function is to bring sinners face to face with the reality of their guilt before God. And also to position them in such a place where they see that Christ is their only means of escape. Paul summed it up this way. The law was put in charge to lead us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. King James Version says the law was a schoolmaster. Schoolmaster is an overstatement. In the Greek it was pedagogus. A pedagogue was a servant whose job was to take the child to school, where, the teacher then, where they then met the school teacher. The pedagogue was to be of a high moral character, a strong disciplinarian. Their role was to protect the child and to bring them to the place of leading, learning. That's why later translations, the NIV, used the word, I think quite correctly, guardian. But you see, that's what the law does. The law protects. It warns you about sin. It challenges sin in your life. It reveals the fact that you need help. The law disciplines. It points out sin. It gives us a context for our lives. And the law ultimately points us away from ourselves. So it brings us to a point where we may be in despair about the kind of woman or the man that I am. I'm never going to get it right. How am I ever going to change? How am I ever going to move myself forwards and deal with this character and this nature that I've got? That's the work of the law of God. It's to bring you to a point of despair. Why? Well, as Paul writes there in Galatians 3, the law functions like a guardian to lead us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. The law has been given so that you might give up on yourself and trust Christ. The law has been given to show you that you're not going to work it out in the end. You can't solve the problem of sin and death. But that Jesus Christ can. Far from putting people off in church, and when it comes to evangelism, the law is essential for drawing people to Christ. And we need to be very aware of this in our evangelism. And to have absolute confidence in the work of the law of God to lead people to Christ. But, and we finish with this this morning, the law is not everything in evangelism. It's only the beginning. And by God's grace next Sunday, we'll begin to look at how the world needs the grace of God for the gospel to be good news. We're going to sing to close this service a great gospel hymn, uh, one that's very uh, precious to many of us, I'm sure. In Christ alone my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song.